I guess I feel like a bit of an imposter finishing a uh, plant science conference as an entomologist, but uh, I'm looking at crop pollination, so I think it's, it, it should be reasonably interesting. Um, yeah, so I'll be, I'm a researcher based at the University of Reading in the Centre for Agri-Environment Research. And today I'm going to be talking about sustainable pollination services for UK crops. So as a bit of background then, crop pollination, um, you may be surprised to hear that more than 75% of globally grown crop species benefit to a greater or lesser extent on animals for pollination. I was certainly surprised by this. And by increasing transfer of pollen between anthers and stigmas, either within plants or between plants, um, animal pollinators can improve the seed set, fruit set and yield of many crops. But their contribution to quality, crop quality, is becoming increasingly well understood as well. For example, strawberries, um, with increased levels of insect pollination, uh, it can improve the storability and shelf life of strawberries. The oil content of oilseed rape crops is increased by insect pollination. And some of our research has shown how good levels of insect pollination in apple orchards improves the quality of apples produced. So a colleague of mine, Tom Breeze, at the University of Reading, actually looked at the contribution of insect pollinators to crops in the UK, and he was able to get an estimate of the value of this contribution to UK agricultural production at more than £630 million per annum. So they're making a really important contribution. We don't have any kind of bats or interesting birds as pollinators in the UK, but we do have a lot of interesting insects. Um, all of which are potential crop pollinators. Of course, we've got our honeybees, which I'm sure you all know about. We've also got a number of solitary bee species, uh, bumblebees, hoverflies, also many other fly species, um, lepidopterans like butterflies and moths, beetles, many of which are potential crop pollinators. And I'm sure you've also heard, it's pretty uh, often covered in the media, talking about uh, pollinators in crisis, um, colony collapse disorder in honeybees. Well, here's a few facts about the current state of pollinators in the UK and across Europe. So at Reading, we've done some research looking at the number of honeybee hives we find in European countries and how this has changed from 1985 to 2005. And across Europe, we've seen significant declines in the numbers of honeybee hives that are kept. And in fact, in England, Particularly, we've seen a significant decline in the number of honeybee hives. So certainly the capacity of honeybees to pollinate crops in the UK has certainly diminished. And in fact, our research has shown that the amount of honeybee hives we have in the UK has nowhere near the capacity to pollinate all the crops that demand insect pollination for improved yield and quality. So that's our honeybees, but we know they're not our only uh, crop pollinator. There's also many wild pollinators in the UK, including 230 species about of um, other bee species, uh, 260 species about of hoverflies, 59 species of butterflies, and of course many others. So the most recent research looking at the current status of these guys um, uses historical data from Great Britain, Belgium, and the Netherlands, which are some of the few countries where we actually have data to carry out this analysis. And if you look at the change in species richness over time from the 60s to the 90s, we saw significant declines in many of these pollinator groups. So there have been long-term declines in species richness and homogenization of pollinator communities. But actually over the last 20 or so years, the rate of this decline has started to decrease, which is encouraging, perhaps a result of agri-environment schemes or, or more measured use of insecticide perhaps. But whatever, whatever we say, changing um, climates, changing land use, uh, continued use of insecticide is certainly likely to impact pollinator communities. And for this reason, the Insect Pollinator Initiative was set up. And this was aimed at looking at the causes and consequences of pollinator decline. And the project I was working on was one of nine projects um, in this initiative, and it was the Sustainable Pollination Services for UK Crops project. We had really three primary objectives in this project. We wanted to go out there and identify which pollinators are the most important for crop production in the UK. We then wanted to really pin down what contribution they're making to production and actually whether yield or, or production may be limited by a lack of insect pollination service. And then we wanted to start trying to understand how we might manage pollination services 
to maintain the stability of crop production in the UK. If you'd like any more information about the, the work involved in this project, um, we've got a, a project website, crop-pollination.co.uk. So first off, trying to understand what's out there pollinating UK crops. So we worked on, on in commercial uh, orchards and fields of, of four, four crops, apples down in Kent, we worked on field beans in the West Berkshire, we looked at oilseed rape fields in Yorkshire and strawberry fields in Yorkshire as well. So all these crops are important crops in the UK and all dependent to a greater or lesser extent on insect pollinators. So in these fields we carried out several uh, pollinator survey techniques. We walked transects, catching and identifying insect pollinators. We put out water traps to get an understanding of the general abundance and diversity of, of floral visiting insects. And we carried out timed observations in our crops. And over the three years of our studies, we collected quite a few pollinator specimens, which we took back to the laboratory for identification. So what did we find then? Well, this chart simply shows the percentage of visits made by some potentially important crop pollinators to apple blossoms, honeybees, bumblebees, solitary bees, and hoverflies. And as you can see, apple blossoms, the most abundant visitors were honeybees and solitary bees. If we look at the different crop beans, we see a rather different situation. Here, bumblebees are certainly the most abundant floral visitors in bean fields. In strawberries, we see a different situation again. Bumblebees and honeybees were our most abundant visitor. And oilseed rape, we see a rather different situation. We've got our usual suspects here, but there were also uh, a large number of other flower visitors, flies and beetles. So I think if nothing else, this sort of highlights how the pollinator community visiting any of these crops is very crop specific. But that's only half the story. It's not just about visitation in the field, it's also about how well, how good they are at pollinating those crops. So we observed some interesting behavior during our surveys. Um, here we've got a, a, a bean plant and a bean flower being visited by Bombus uh, pascorum. And in order to access the nectar of this bean flower, the, the bee will land on the front of the flower and has to force its way to the base of the flower to extract the nectar. And in so doing, we'll come into contact with the anthers and stigmas. Um, improve pollination and improve bean set. But we did observe some other behaviour here. We've got Bombus terrestris in the same bean field. Um, it'll land on a bean flower, but actually sneak round to the back of the flower, nibble a small hole, and extract nectar directly out of the base of the flower. Even cheekier still, we've got a honeybee here that will visit the same flower, and actually their mandibles aren't strong enough to nibble a hole in the base of the bean flower but it'll just use a hole already used, um, created by, by a bumblebee. So neither of these pollinators are actually contributing to pollination of beans. So another component of our work was to look at the pollination efficiency of different pollinators for different crops. So in order to do this, we built flight cages at the University of Reading and the University of Leeds. And these were great because they enabled us to manipulate flowering crops and manipulate our pollinators and control their interactions and compare the pollination efficiency of different pollinators for different crops. So we grew our four study crops here in pots, and when they were in flower, we put them in cages with our different pollinators. We worked with four pollinators. Here we've got Osmia bicornis, a common solitary bee in the UK, the red mason bee, Bombus terrestris, perhaps the most common bumblebee species we find in the UK, uh, Episurphus boltiatus, Again, uh, a common uh, hoverfly species, actually commercially available as a biocontrol agent, which is why we used it. And, of course, honeybees, Apis mellifera. So what did we find then? So this graph shows pod set in beans following visitation by our different pollinators. Uh, bumblebee seems to be missing there, but bumblebees, honeybees, hoverflies and mason bees. And we also had a couple of control treatments with hand pollination and... Uh, pollinators in excluded entirely. And for beans, we found that the solitary bee and our bumblebee species were really effective bean pollinators. This was oilseed, looking at seeds per pod for oilseed, again with our same four pollinators. Here we found a rather different situation. All of our pollinators were really quite effective at increasing seeds, seed set in oilseed rate. Um, hoverflies were slightly less effective than the other three, but all pretty good oilseed rate pollinators. We also did a similar experiment with apples. So we had apples in, in pots, and we put apples when they're in flower into cages with our different pollinators. And we actually recorded visits to apple flowers by these pollinators, and then we followed those apple flowers through to fruit set. We looked at seed set of the apples, and we looked at apple quality. 
at harvest. And as you can see, as visit numbers to the flowers increases, we see fruit set in our apples increasing significantly for all our pollinators, which is great news. All these pollinators are, are effective at improving fruit set and pollination in apple orchards. But we did find that hoverflies were significantly less effective than our other pollinators. And actually, as visitation increased, uh, honeybees became more effective and we got better fruit set. So I think if you think about the abundance that we find in our crops and in our orchards, and then we consider the pollination efficiency of our different pollinator taxa, we can really start to build up a picture of those pollinators which are most important for the crops that we were studying. But what are they contributing to in our crops? This was our next question. So this is just a theoretical um, graph. We've got crop yield here, or crop quality, or whatever crop production metric you want to consider. And imagine you grow your crop plant, and during flowering, you don't allow any insect pollinators to visit any of the flowers of that crop, but you do allow self-pollination or, or wind pollination, and then you measure the yield of that crop. If you take that same crop plant, but during flowering, you allow it to be, you allow the flower to, flowers to be visited by the, the pollinators that you'd find in a, in a commercial field in the wider environment. That would be your observed yield. If you then take the same plant, but during flowering, you actually saturate that plant with insect pollinators, um, or perhaps hand pollinate that plant to create a theoretical maximal or optimal level of pollination. That's your maximum. The difference between these two treatments represents the contribution insect pollinators make to the production of that crop. The difference between these two treatments represents a potential pollination deficit, a potential yield loss due to suboptimal or a lack of insect pollinators in that situation. So we actually went out into our crop fields and we implemented these treatments. We used exclusion bags to restrict access to flowers by insect pollinators and we used hand pollination techniques to increase levels of pollination. So what did we find then? Well, this is uh, some data from Cox and Gala orchards down in Kent. And these are two important um, apple varieties in the UK. And this shows fruit set in our orchards. So when we excluded pollinators from apple blossoms, we saw a significant reduction in fruit set. So clearly insect pollinators are really important for fruit set in apples and make an important contribution to production. But with hand pollination techniques, we actually significantly increased fruit set in our orchards. So this suggests perhaps maybe there's a pollination deficit here. But with apples, the story's a bit more complicated. It's not just about the fruit set you get in apple orchards. It's the quality of those apples that you get that contribute to the value of production. So we also looked at apple quality under our different pollination treatments. We took several measures from our apples, including we looked at the size, the weight, sugar content, firmness, and we found a different story for our Cox and our Gala apples. In Cox, we found that hand pollination actually reduced apple size, undoubtedly because of higher fruit densities, resulting in smaller apples. But for Gala, hand pollination still significantly increased apple size and apple quality. The number of class one fruit produced was increased. So we took this a step further and actually looked at farm gate output from our apple orchards under our different pollination treatments in thousands of pounds per hectare. And clearly, apple is a really valuable crop, you can see from this. But our treatment showed that insect pollinators contribute more than 10,000 pounds per hectare to both these apple varieties, which is huge. But due to impacts on both fruit set, so yield and quality, we found that there's potentially significant pollination deficits in gala apple orchards, in fact, up to 6,000 pounds per hectare. So you can imagine a situation where if you actually improve pollination service in your gala orchards, you can improve production significantly. So I'll just summarise. Um, we've shown from our research that different crops are visited by different pollinator communities. We've shown that different crops are effectively pollinated by different pollinator taxa. And we've shown that insect pollinators are really important for the yield and quality of a number of crops. But we have identified potential pollination deficits in some of these crops. And I think this kind of data, when you start identifying which tax are important for which crops in terms of pollination and crop production, we can start to understand the potential consequences of pollinator decline and loss of species. <coughs>
We might also start to be able to look at targeting pollinator management strategies at particular pollinator groups, at particular pollinator species, and target those at particular crops for which they're effective pollinators. Essentially, we're trying to develop a set of pollinator management strategies um, that will enable us to have a, a diverse and robust pollinator management strategy in the face of continued environmental and uh, climate change. For example, in apple orchards, we know solitary bees are really effective apple pollinators. So maintaining solitary bee habitat in and around orchards is really important. We've shown from our data that honeybees can be effective strawberry pollinators and that you find them in abundance in strawberry fields. So targeted placement of hives within strawberry fields could improve production when it's needed. Effectively, we're trying to avoid situations like we've seen in some countries, for example, the US, where almond production is huge, but it's almost entirely dependent on, on honeybees. So tens of thousands of honeybee hives are taken into almond orchards every year during flowering to provide pollination services because wild pollinator communities are inadequate. And relying on one pollinator to provide your pollination services is a risky business. When honeybee losses started to increase, the price of honeybees went through the roof, the price of almond production went through the roof. And of course you have disasters like this, where a lorry load of honeybees crashes on the freeway. And in China as well, um, in some landscapes, the uh, wild pollinator community has been so depleted around apple orchards that they're actually having to go in and hand pollinate whole orchards of apples in order to get a meaningful yield. In our research, I've done quite a lot of hand pollination of apple blossoms, and I wouldn't relish doing this across a whole orchard. It would be a nightmare. So it just remains me to um, thank uh, or acknowledge the funders and uh, collaborators of the research. I'd like to acknowledge everyone who's been involved in the uh, Sustainable Pollination Services for UK Crops project, and I'd like to thank UK Plant Sciences and the Society of Biology for having me come here and talk to you. Thank you very much, Liz.